Um, okay, sorry for the delay. Um, <clears throat> so the leg, I forgot to upload the lecture. That's what the delay was. The uh, today's lecture should be now uploaded as a PDF uh, to the website, and I made some modifications to the lecture slides from lecture one on Monday. So there's a new version of that there if you want to upload that too. There's just some annotations that are, are a bit different. We're going to start first. Any questions from last lecture that you'd like to review or anything? No? Okay. We're going to go through some of these definitions of image quality um, and then look at x-ray physics and uh, the interaction of x-rays with matter uh, today uh, to start off on x-ray imaging. So. Uh, in the book, uh, the book's very good on, on this stuff. So the chapters three and four, uh, three for the image quality stuff, you should read that and pay attention to it. And most of the figures are going to come out of that. Uh, and chapter four is good as well. And so recall, we were looking at what an image is. And it's a spatial you know, modulation of, of a signal. right? So if you have just a plain gray background, that's one image, but there's nothing in it. right? It's like the null image. And then structure gets built up in an image, and uh, by you know changing the intensity as a function of position in the in the field of view. And fundamentally, you can create any function in that field of view using uh, Fourier expansion or Fourier coefficients. And so, a lot of what we're going to do in this course is looking at uh, the spatial frequency spectrum of of images, like what. You know, edges have very high frequencies, uh, sort of smooth uh, Gaussian functions have lower frequencies, etc. And so the understanding of what a modulation is in an image is on this slide here, where we have a constant uh, background, and then we modulate the intensity as a function of position in space with a sine wave. That's the simplest kind of modulation we can do. Right, other than just a constant line or something like that. And if we're going to build up uh, a set of pictures from Fourier expansion, then we would all of these spatial frequencies would be uh, in uh, the function that we're, we're trying to image. The, the reason it's very convenient to look at it that way is because most of the time the description of how your imaging system modifies uh, the spatial frequencies that are you know, on the input side of the system to the image that comes on the output side, that is usually described as a, you know, a linear system where it, frequencies come in, they get attenuated a certain amount, and they come out the back end of your detector, right? And that's uh, described here. This is out of the book again, where you have some kind of modulation comes in, uh, the, your imaging system attenuates that particular spatial frequency, and that's what comes out the back end. And that's essentially a filter, right? So if I have really high frequency noise and I, and I put that one dimensional amplitude signal through a filter such that it, it gets, you know, uh, only the low frequencies come in, all of the clicking and clacking go, goes away, the high frequency stuff. Similar with images where the high frequency stuff are, are spikes. In the, in the image, that's really high frequency data, or really sharp edges that are high frequency data. So this uh, is usually described as a modulation transfer function that describes the, the behavior of the whole imaging system. So here's an example of a bar pattern, and um, let's laser here, where we have a, essentially a spatial frequency, or cycles per millimeter, in the plane, right, of uh, a bar pattern, and that spatial frequency increases as I go farther down the pattern here, such that I have more cycles per millimeter here than I do up here, right, where, or cycles per centimeter, whatever you want, it's in space along this direction. And if my imaging system uh, attenuates low frequencies very little, Say I say 90% of this signal uh, goes through my imaging system. What the output looks like, you know, is this. Right? It's, it's the edges of this thing are blurred, but you can see this fundamental 
frequency is still there, you're still going to have maximum contrast between the, the trough here and this peak here. Right? As we go to higher frequencies, the system may attenuate those high frequencies. So here we have a, a much higher frequency, four cycles per millimeter. And the system may attenuate that by you know, as much as 90% or close to 90%. 87% such that that frequency when you look at it on the output there's a point at which you can't even determine that there is an oscillation there anymore it's just crushed down into an into a mean value okay? and that's what's called the modulation transfer function it's how these spatial frequencies uh, are passed through the system you can graph this attenuation as a function of spatial frequency and we'll say at, at very low frequencies, 100% of the signal comes through. As the oscillations get higher in frequency, here's three cycles per millimeter, four cycles per millimeter. This shows you how much it's attenuated. This function is called the modulation transfer function. And once you've measured that for your imaging system, that characterizes the effect that your system has on the spatial resolution of the signal coming in. Um, you know, all of us have modulation transfer functions in our eyes, right? You, you can see up to a certain spatial frequency with your eyes, and some people need glasses to see, you know, high, high sharp edges, right? Uh, and so it, there's kind of that limit. There's no point in making pictures that are far beyond that limit for someone who's observing it as to whether or not they can see the higher frequencies. It, it, you kind of get to this... Uh, point, if you go to Circuit City or wherever the hell they sell TVs now, right, um, they, you know, and you see the, the highest resolution television you can get, it's, it's getting to the point where it's kind of beyond your perception, right? That if you stand at three meters from the TV and the, and the actual spatial frequencies that are coming out of that thing are probably higher than you can actually perceive with your eyes, right? Um, so that's that's the modulation transfer function. And here's just uh, some very simple examples of how the MTF changes the appearance of, of images as, as it changes. Okay, so here's a, a, an image acquired with a CT scanner. And uh, the parameters for the, the acquisition of this, this will make sense to you in a little while. This is the tube current, the amount of electrons hitting the, the target. This is the energy of those electrons, the peak energy. And it produces this picture. Right? If we crank up the tube current right, to a, a higher value and the energy of those electrons, we get a better picture. Right? So the raw data that is used to make this reconstruction just has better high frequency information in it than the data for this one. Because when we look, zoom in and look at you know, these line pairs here, these are holes drilled in the phantom. You can see uh, an oscillation in intensity where the hole is, you get a, a dark signal, and where the background is, you get a bright signal. In that first image, when we do that same profile, we get something that looks like this. And so that modulation has, has gone down at, at this frequency. If we did the same profile up here at the low frequency, we would see basically no change, except at the edges of these holes, right? The edges would be blurred, but the depth of the hole would be the same. So any questions about that? Okay. We talked about this last time, um, that we have uh, another way of characterizing the spatial resolution is to put a very small object, let's say the size of the laser pointer here, a little dot, and we image that dot. So just That's the only thing in the, in the field of view is just, just in x-ray you could use a gold bead. Sometimes what we use is we take a pen, like a cheap ballpoint pen, and you just take the ballpoint out of the pen, and that gives you a, a really hard little metallic uh, sphere. And, and you image that, and it's well be below the basic pixel size of, of the picture you're going to make. And then when you image that thing, you, what you get is a Gaussian function. It's a, it's a, a blurred picture of that 
dot that is that is quite tiny. You can't resolve that thing in your imaging system. That's the point. We're we're using a impulse uh, signal that's much you know higher spatial frequency than we can resolve, but you can measure the shape of this curve, and that gives you the sort of underlying point spread function of a delta function or a, or a very small uh, dot in your imaging system. And you can imagine that if this width gets wider and wider for different systems, that means if it's wider, that's a lower resolution system. Right? It blurs that signal into a, a broader spatial uh, distribution. If it's really sharp and narrow, then it's a high uh, resolution system. Okay. Uh, the Raleigh criterion is developed by taking two of these dots and bringing them close together and asking the question, when can you no longer perceive that you have two dots and you just have one signal? And that's, that's another definition of spatial resolution. Interestingly, super resolution microscopy is done by having um, events that you detect at a low enough frequency such that this overlap here doesn't ever occur, right? And so you get, you get uh, sort of individual events detected in your microscope. Each one is one of these point spread functions, but if it, if it happens in isolation, you can actually measure where is the, the peak of this thing, and that's where my object is. And so you get around this resolution limit by just reducing the flux of signals such that you get these independent Gaussian blobs coming out and you, you map the, the basically the center of mass of each of those blobs and that gives you a quote unquote super resolution image. Right? That's in a different course though. Um, this is, is what's defined in the book as local contrast. So if I have in space uh, a signal, and I have, a, say, a background, and then I have a target object here, and then a background again, a definition of local contrast, according to the book, and we'll use this definition for local contrast, is the difference in signal intensity measured between the background and the target divided by the signal in the background. So that's essentially like a fractional change or a percentage change in signal, right? Gives you your contrast. This definition of contrast makes sense for x-rays, if you're counting x-rays. It also makes sense if you're counting nuclear decay. So you have a, a uh, basically a radionuclide in the patient and it's giving off gamma rays and you're counting those. Then this contrast makes sense. And the reason it makes sense is because regardless of the total number of you know, photons that we detect in our detector, um, this fractional contrast will stay the same. Right? Both the, as we detect more in the background, the background number increases, as does the target number, and this fraction will stay the same. Just your ability to measure the accuracy of that will increase as you use more photons. Right? However, people don't really perceive this. right? This is a, a good definition for x-rays. Uh, if you're doing plain film x-ray or you're looking at raw data for CT, what, what humans perceive when you're, when you're looking at an image is essentially the, just the raw contrast to noise between the object, the background, and how much noise is in, is in the field of view. And we'll see that definition in a minute. And most of the assignments we do and everything will use raw contrast to noise as opposed to this fractional local contrast as it's defined in the book. So here's uh, just an example. Uh, that's the same uh, uh, phantom. Uh, well, actually, we're gonna, we'll, we'll return and look at this part of the field of view to look at the signal to noise or the raw contrast to noise between this dot and the background, but that's going to come a bit later once we introduce noise. So noise um, is, is essentially random signal that's superimposed on your object. Okay. And 
the difference, so sometimes you, you will see just, you know, an increase in the sort of random signal, just, uh, you can't really use television noise anymore, because television noise is all busted up, bad digital transmission. Uh, but I don't know if anybody listens to a radio anymore, <laughs> like in the car. But sometimes when you're going between stations, you basically all you hear is noise, and that's just like white random noise. That's voltage that just has no pattern, right? Um, it's, it's an interesting concept. It's just like if I have a string of numbers and they're truly random, right? That's called white noise. That means all frequencies are represented in there, high frequencies, low frequencies, everything equally well. And so if we look at this picture on the right, there's a lot of noise in this picture. There's just random pixel variation on top of our underlying signal. Right? So you can quantify that just by looking at the statistics of that random, random signal. This is distinct from uh, artifact, which is signal that isn't the object, right? Uh, but is itself somehow coherent, right? So you might have a reflection of the object superimposed on the object or something like that. That's artifact. That gets in the way of your perception of the object, but we usually don't characterize that as noise. Noise is, is a random signal. Uh, the signal-to-noise ratio is usually computed by taking a mean value in an area and then sampling some place where you can sample the noise to figure out what its amplitude is. Right? And then uh, calculating a ratio. So if we look at this set, which was on the last slide, the signal to noise ratio is going down significantly as we go here because the mean value of the brain here divided by the amount of noise is going to be a smaller number than over here. As we blur the image or we we can pass, say, a convolution filter across the image, or we can blur it with, uh, you know, averaging, say, four pixels in a group together and move that across the image. Um, you will increase the signal to noise, but you'll reduce your spatial resolution as you as you blur. So here's an example of uh, a phantom that we use to uh, look at the CT scanner that we work with. And this phantom uh, represents a, a heart. And the uh, gray stuff here is a, a resin that comes out of a 3D printer. And this is a cavity. And in the cavity, we put contrast agent. And so you get brightness here, resin here. This is air back here, right? This acquisition, everything uh, so that we set uh, energy, etc., and we turn up, crank up the number of electrons hitting our tube to make x-rays to 600 ma milliamps, right, is the, con is the current. And the reason we pick 600 is that as high as you can go. That's as much as you can do. You, you can crank away, it's not going to give you any more, right? 50 ma is as low as you can put that uh, current. And I'm not really sure of the confidence of when you ask for 50, might give you 47, might give you 43, I don't know, it might get a little bit imprecise down there. But fewer electrons are used to make x-rays. We have fewer photons to make this picture. And you can see the difference in the signal to noise, right? There's a higher amount of noise in the background here than there is here, okay? When you look at your, um, this is the new, should be in the new slides. Um, this region of interest can be drawn around a group of pixels, and inside that region of interest, you can ca calculate the mean value of the image intensity there. And, and in this case, it's like 673 is the mean value there. The units don't matter right now. Uh, the standard deviation of the pixels inside that circle uh, is 29. So the mean is 672 divided by 29. So that kind of gives you the confidence you have in, in that mean, in that area, or the probability of getting a pixel of a certain value inside this stuff. It should be uniform, right? Right here. 
when we use 12 times as many photons to make the picture, we get 675, so it's basically the same mean, and the standard deviation here is 10. So it's dropped. We, we get a much more constant uh, value. And you can take a look at the different values um, uh, on the slide itself. So what does it mean to characterize the noise in the background? So let's put a box around this area of that phantom, the, the first phantom we looked at, and we'll just plot as a histogram the pixel values inside that box. Right? So I have, you know, it says I have 20,000. I don't believe that. Uh, pixels inside this box, and that's the distribution of values I see. Okay? So it's, it's around a mean here of 195 right here, uh, plus or minus, the, let's, we assume this is a Gaussian distribution, a normal distribution, with a sigma value of 3.4. And so the sigma value tells you the spread of random values in that, in that background. In this image, where we use fewer photons, we use the same scale when we when we plot the histogram we get something that looks like this it's much broader right so the mean is 192 basically the same but now sigma the distribution the width of that is 8.3 and so the noise is higher right so this is that single number 8.3 in this case 3.4 in this case basically characterizes the level of noise in that field of view under the assumption that that noise is following a Gaussian distribution usually right? sometimes and most of the time for the imaging stuff we do it will be following a Gaussian distribution it will be a normal distribution of random numbers right? and so now let's define co the contrast to noise ratio the local contrast to noise ratio this isn't that definition we were looking at previously of local contrast. This is the contrast to noise ratio between this target signal and the background. We measured on the previous slide the background RMS, it was root mean square deviation, RMS or sigma, is 3.4. And so we look at the signal of the object, we do a profile through the object, and we see here's the background, there's the object. It goes down to 115 here and comes back up to 195 here. So it's 115 minus 195 divided by sigma. So that's the signal to noise. Signal to noise for this object right here is 23.5, minus 23.5 because it's negative, right? Here, we do the same thing, draw a line through the object, measure what that the minimum value is right here it turns out to be minus 156 so now we have 156 minus 192 which is the background mean divided by 8.3 so the signal to noise of this object here in the background is minus 4.3 minus 23.5 minus 4.3 those numbers are important and the reason is uh, you can characterize human the ability to perceive things with these numbers. So if I ask you the question, is there an object in this field of view? The probability you would get that right is proportional to this signal to noise. Right? And so here's this dot. You have to decide, is that real or is that just noise? And it turns out that if the signal to noise is five or greater, you're going to be correct 99% of the time. If the signal to noise gets down to about two, you're wrong maybe 40% of the time. Right? So, and this is essentially what, when you get to understand images and, and you look at a picture and you say, well, what's the signal to noise of this picture? This is the, the parameter that people mostly use. Yeah. Uh, so you're using a phantom to do this sort of diagnostic understanding of how your system operates. Does that have to be done with different types of tissue, like tissue 
with a phantom that mimics different types of tissue, different types of based on the environment and the organ that you're looking at, or right. So I'm going to repeat the question because I don't think this mic will pick it up. So they, so the the question is, which that's fine. The question is, um, if you're characterizing the ability of your system to produce a specific signal to noise, do you have to do it with particular materials and particular patterns? And the answer is yes, right? So, and the reason is specifically in X-ray, as we'll see, uh, different materials attenuate X-rays differently. And they also modify the energy spectrum of the beam differently. And so where an object is in the field of view actually matters, right, for these, these parameters. So it, it's pretty complicated in CT and X-ray. In NMR, it's less complicated. Right? OK, so that takes us to the end of uh, image quality. And now we're going to look at x-ray imaging and x-ray production. Uh, no, that's 17. Uh, I think this must be it. Yeah, okay. Okay, any other questions about base? Yes? Um, you were, I think, I don't know if the noise and contrast noise the same really? Are they the same? I, if you repeat the question, so I'm sorry. Are signals and contrast to noise the same thing? Um, actually, not really. Um, so, contrast to noise is what you use when you have a background and a target in the background. And signal to noise is what you measure when you just put an ROI on a part of the picture, measure its amplitude divided by the noise. So that's so if we go back to the the picture we had up here a second ago. Let's go back to To here, okay. So if I measure the signal intensity inside this region of interest and then divide it by the noise, that is the signal to noise of that material at that position, okay. If, on the other hand, I measure the signal difference between this and this, and I assume the noise is the same over that field of view then the contrast to noise would be that signal difference divided by the noise. It gets a little complicated because in x-ray imaging, the noise, as you'll see when you look at these values in your slides, the noise here is actually different than the noise here. And so now you have to pick, okay, let's take maybe the average of the noise or, or some other definition like that, or maybe the larger of the two noises. It turns out that when you have high intensity pixels in CT, that means the attenuation of the photons was greater. And we'll see why this, this is true. So this is a contrast agent which attenuates more photons. That means that the detector saw fewer photons in making this picture than it did in making this or air, right? And when you have fewer photons, the uncertainty in the number you count goes up. And so the noise changes depending on the value of the, of the thing. So that was a good question. So signal to noise is just an element itself divided by its noise. Contrast to noise, you look at a target and a background. So I had one question. Yeah. So, um, with regards to the value and to determine if what you're looking at is actually a noise or actually another object in yeah. the background. You said that the numbers, but that only comes with contrast to noise because you're measuring the difference between what you know is correct your object. But if you don't, for example, if you didn't know, like, yeah, because sometimes when you're imaging, like, you're not sure if what am I looking, you're looking for? Is, yeah, what you're looking in the object region per se is, yeah. is really not noise. Like in that case, like, does the value like make a difference to help you understand that? Or I, absolutely. So I think. Let me rephrase the question, yes. or paraphrase the question. So the question is, if 
if I'm trying to perceive an object in the background, and I, what I told you was this, it's called the rose criterion. If your contrast to noise is greater than five, and it's like a disc in a, in a, in a background, then you have a 99% chance of correctly detecting that object is there. What's your performance when you, one, don't know what the object looks like right. and if it's there? And that dramatically affects your ability to detect it. So if you have a large field of view and you're saying, you need to now find an object in this field of view and you have no idea what its shape is, then your performance is going to drop, right? It's yeah. just for in case you can Right. Obviously, if the object is bigger, sometimes it's easier to detect because you can sort of get a mean value over the whole field of the object. And if the mean value of that object is slightly higher than the background, you'll be able to perceive it because you can average more pixels in your head, mm -hmm. right, or in your brain. Right. I, I guess, I guess my only follow up to that is with regards to noise then, defining yes. noise, is it easy to define that in terms of it always being uniform, like a Gaussian pattern, like you said, or because in, in case there's like a significant like blot yeah. Then you know like, only one area and the remaining part around that is not really significant, but there is like noise in it. Noise is like Mo most of the time yeah. we're going to model the noise mm -hmm. as being a uniform, random white process around the object we're trying to detect. Okay. Okay. And anything else we model is artifact. Right? So uh, if there's a streak or there's some kind of other unwanted signal in there. Mm -hmm. right? Thank you. Sure. Uh, da, 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 da. Now, wait here. Okay, 19, yes. Okay. All right, so we're going to start looking at x ray imaging. And uh, this is an x ray image of a human hand, okay. and it's a negative of the image in the sense that the bones are brighter. Right, which means that more photons were absorbed by the bones. Now, you, you could imagine, though, in the actual data when it was taken, you, you'd have a darker, a shadow cast by the bones, right? But when people look at it, they invert it um, historically. And so, is there any way to tell if that's the right or left hand? That's a problem you can take home and think about. Um, but anyway, you can see this fantastic, you know, spatial resolution, uh, the detectors for, you know, detecting x-rays in, in, you know, these systems are really high resolution now, and, the, and so are the uh, x-ray production systems can, can basically produce x-rays from a point or, you know, something that's sort of a fraction of a millimeter, a couple of millimeters. The basic chain, x-ray chain is here. We have uh, x-ray light bulb, shines x-rays through the patient, right? And then on the other side of the patient, we have a detector. And you, and you detect the shadow cast by the patient. This is essentially a fluoroscopy system. Uh, oftentimes, a uh, physician will be doing an intervention while imaging. So they'll be putting in a stent into the person's aorta, or they'll be putting in a valve to their mitral valve, or they'll be injecting contrast agent to see vessels and things like that. So it's a very interactive system. Uh, the system itself can be turned on just by a foot pedal. And so the person's looking at a, a screen, and they push their foot on the floor, and then pictures come up, you know, sort of at 15 frames a second or something like that. X-rays themselves are part of the electromagnetic spectrum. They're up here in terms of energy and wavelength. Uh, for us, the X-rays that we're interested in uh, for diagnostic imaging currently fall between 70 and 140 keV. You know, somewhere in there is our, our zone. There are X-rays of lower energy that are, are impinging on the patient, but they rarely get through the patient. They, they don't make it to the detector, right? Because at lower and lower energies, the photoelectric absorption gets really high, as we'll see, and the, most of those x-rays are absorbed, right? They just go to dose. So you'd actually like to filter them away before you shine them onto the patient. 
This is a uh, x-ray light bulb or a x-ray tube. So this is a vacuum. There's an anode and a cathode up here. And I'm gonna I'm gonna flip it over. I'm sorry about this. So now it's stuck to the ceiling because the diagram on the next page is in this orientation. So this is a motor, right? This is a metallic disc, or it's called an anode because it's positively charged in this system. And that metallic disc spins uh, by using this motor. And the reason you spin the disc is because you have, it's hard to see through here, but there's a, a cathode here. It's like a coil, filament coil that is heated up to a very high temperature and x-rays come firing off this thing. Let me do laser. Come firing off this and hit the anode. Okay. And, uh, sorry, not x-rays, correct that. Electrons boil off this, are accelerated across here by a voltage and hit the anode. The electrons do. Okay. If this was stationary, you could do that for uh, about 10 seconds and then you just blow it, you, you burn a hole in the, in the anode right? with the, the current that we're talking about here. So what they do is they spin this anode around so that the, the target is continuously changing and being cooled. And cooling, it's being cooled through uh, basically conduction this way. Uh, there's wires here that cause a very large voltage between this anode and this cathode, right? And you can imagine we saw on the last page we're interested in 70 to 140 keV, right, is our photons that we're interested in. That's the energy of the photons we're interested in. So the electrons have to have that energy when they hit the target at least to produce photons that have this energy. And so we accelerate those electrons across this gap. It's in a vacuum. They hit the target. And the collision of those electrons with stuff in the target produces x-rays. Okay. Here's the, the uh, basic diagram of that system. Cathode here, spinning anode in the vacuum. We're going to put current through the cathode at given milliamp and we're going to set that anywhere from 50 to 1500 milliamps is where x-ray tubes operate now. Uh, the tungsten filament is heated up to a very high uh, temperature to boil off these electrons. They accelerate across here, hit the target, and the x-rays come shooting out here. They go in all directions, but we'll collimate them to shoot out in one direction. Um, any questions about that? This thing's worth about $25,000 or something. It's a pretty expensive light bulb, 25 to 100 probably. And one of the big jumps in, in CT technology is making this thing powerful enough to image very fast because you need a lot of x-rays in a short period of time. right? And so essentially you have to be able to put a lot of tube current in this thing and make a lot of x-rays with this thing in a short period of time. Okay. And so these, these tubes have gone up and up and up in, in performance over the last three decades. So it's like an x-ray light bulb. If you burn it out, it's, it's a big deal. It costs a lot of money. So you don't want to do anything silly. You know, if you, if you basically just image too much on a phantom or something like that, you can cause damage. And so usually there's things in the system that will stop you doing that. And heaven forbid you're, you're doing it when there's a person being imaged, right? So there's usually there should be safeties in the system that don't let you put too many x-rays into a person. So how are the x-rays produced in that target? So now we're going to look and see what happens when a single electron comes here and hits the target. Okay. What happens to that electron is it comes through, 90% of them just basically hit other electrons in the tungsten and knock them in, and you get another electron flying through the tungsten at somewhat lower velocity, and then it hits another electron, goes through and hit, hits another electron, and just fire on this cascade of stuff happens, and the thing heats up. That's 90% of what happens, okay? That doesn't produce any photons. It just produces heat in, in the target. That's too bad. 
two ways, two primary ways of producing photons. Uh, one is that this electron coming from our cathode hits an inner shell electron uh, in the target. That electron is ejected, and then uh, an outer shell electron drops into the orbit of the one that you, the K electron that you ejected from your target. And when this drops, the difference in energy between those two energy levels is emitted as a photon, right? And, you know, so it's just a quantum mechanical thing. It comes out at exactly the energy of the energy difference between this shell and this shell, that electron. And that's called a characteristic X-ray. Comes out of very specific energy, right? And it's a very sharp line on a spectrum. So this is how when, say, astronomers look at a star and they say, what's in the star? They look for these characteristic X-ray things from specific atoms. And, you know, that, that will, will tell you what's there. But principally, the, our, uh, the X-rays we're going to use come from this source, which is called Bremsstrahlung. And Bremsstrahlung is German for breaking. And so what happens is the electron comes through, interacts with the atom by getting accelerated, uh, you know, from a, an electrostatic effect, sort of a charge effect. It comes through, gets really close to the nucleus, and it takes a hard turn, and then it loses energy in that, in that process, and the energy comes out as a photon. And so a, a Bremsstrahlung photon is released, and these are released at energies anywhere from the maximum possible energy. So if this electron, here's my, my nucleus, and it comes up and it does like a 180, you're just like right into it, then you get the maximum release because you've got, say, a 140 keV electron gets completely stopped when a 140 keV photon comes out. If it takes a hard break, a, a lower energy comes out. So we get a spectrum of photons coming out with this process. And this is what the spectrum looks like. If, let, let's say we set our peak voltage on our tube to 120 keV, so I'm accelerating electrons across that, that gap between the cathode and the anode, and it's 120 keV voltage there. Uh, then I can get photons, the relative intensity or number of photons, this is like a histogram, at different energies just by the Bremsstrahlung process looks like this. And it would continue, if none of these photons were filtered, it would continue up in a straight line to here. And that's, that's the density or the intensity of the photons as a function of energy that come out of the tube. Here are the characteristic lines for a tungsten target. You know, these, these are the K-shell ejections. And then the relative X-ray intensity as we get to lower and lower energies drops. And the reason for that as, at those lower energies is those X-rays are absorbed, right, before they, they get to the patient. Or even actually, I, if you have your X-ray tube here, usually there's some kind of metallic filter right in front of the exit and it takes out a lot of these low energy photons. And the glass in the, the tube, the tungsten target itself will absorb low energy x-rays that are trying to get out of the target. So you just don't see them uh, when, you, when you look at what's coming out of your x-ray tube. And that's a good thing because all of these would never make it through the patient. So there's zero probability that one of those x-rays, when it enters the patient, is going to come out the back. All they would do is deposit energy in the patient. Right? And so you don't really want those photons going in there because they're not improving your image. They're just delivering dose to the, to the patient. So <clears throat> if we then take our, our x-ray tube or our system and we turn the dial down to 100 keV peak, we get this spectrum of x-rays coming out of the system, and we image with that spectrum. So you can change the spectrum on, on your system. So what happens to the x-ray when it you know, travels through the patient or travels through anything? 
Okay. <clears throat> There's two dominant interactions of the X-ray with matter that that you know we're concerned with in making contrast in X-ray pictures. The first is the photoelectric effect, and you can think of this as the incident photon sort of interacting chemically with with the material itself. So, they, so where are we now? We've created a photon, it's coming out of our x-ray tube, it's going into a patient, and it's now going to interact with molecules in fat, bone, liver, blood, contrast agent, stuff like that. So that x-ray is coming through. If the x-ray goes all the way through the patient, we, we get a detected event on the other side, right? And if they all went through the patient, you wouldn't have a picture, right? All you'd see is just a bunch of x-rays there. There'd be no contrast, but they don't all go through. What you image is the shadow. It's like the difference, right? It's like the differential absorption as a function of position through the patient. So ideally, how many do you think you should have absorbed in the patient versus detected? Should 99% hit the detector, or should 1% hit the detector, or what, anybody have a have a guess? If you were to, if you just had to guess, you know, or someone take was going to take your lunch. I mean, you got you got to do an answer. Like, what's the answer? Nobody's going to guess. Huh? Yeah. You got to commit. Everybody's going, yeah, 50%. I don't know. It's like, I would have said 50%. That would be my, my guess, right? I have no idea what the answer is. So it's just, we can figure this out. Like, you, you basically have to have a bunch of photons detected to get any signal, right? If 99% are absorbed, you get only a few things, and your signal is going to be really poor. If 99% of the photons get through, you're going to have really good signal. You can measure the counts with high accuracy. Not much contrast, because you only got 1% of the photons didn't get through to cast the shadow. So it's sort of like, what is the shadow and what is the detected stuff? So it's an interesting question. Maybe we'll put it on a problem set. Okay, I don't know what the answer is. Um, so two processes occur in the, in the patient. One is a uh, photoelectric effect where you can have the photon hit an electron in the atom, you get this photoelectron ejected with a drop, again, it's the same thing that we saw with the electron hitting the target, a drop of an outer shell back into a lower shell, and you get this characteristic radiation coming out. We're not going to use this radiation, usually. This is just a way that the photons are getting absorbed. Remember, that's all we're talking about here. All we care about is that the photon gets absorbed. And then, um, now I've forgotten how an auger electron comes out. How does that happen? Does anyone know? How does an auger electron come out? Well, I'll, I'll get back to this. It, it might come to me, but <laughs> I've forgotten. Um, so anyway, this is uh, the photoelectric effect, which is the interaction of the incident x-ray with sort of the chemical composition slash electron shells of, of the material. And then the primary method for generating contrast or stopping these photons is Compton scattering. So what happens is we get a, a photon comes in, knocks uh, an electron out of the atom, right? and then you get a, it, it doesn't give all of its energy off to that electron, but it scatters off at an angle. And then that photon, the scattered photon, can do that again. Right? And so you get a cascade of these Compton interactions such that the incident photon you had goes da, 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 and then it's, it's done. You don't detect it. And it's been absorbed, right? Um, if this angle is high enough as well, it might say you only had one Compton interaction. The photon came through, hit an electron, that electron goes off, the photon goes this way. It might miss your detector, right, because it's high enough angle. 
So that's good. It got absorbed, right? And the, so you're generating contrast. But it also, if the angle isn't high enough, right, it'll come through, deflect, and then hit the detector, but not on the correct line. <laughs> it's hitting it from a, from a different angle, right, which is quite confusing. That's called scatter. And so the, the energy dependence of these two effects are, pretty, are the following, in that the probability of having a photoelectric interaction uh, goes basically as the atomic number to the fourth power and energy over energy cubed. Okay, so the energy of the photon itself. So the lower energy photons are much higher probability to, to interact with the electron shell and cause photoelectric effect. The higher energy photons are much less probable. For a uh, the uh, Compton scattering, the probability goes as the atomic number right, uh, of, the, of the atom itself. So basically the density of the electron cloud. We can see the, um, over the set of energies that we might see out of our x-ray tube, say 10 keV all the way out to 150, the percentage of interactions at, at that energy, which are Compton interactions. And you can see as we get up to about 50, 60, pretty well in this range, they're all essentially Compton interactions, right? By this time, the, the photoelectric stuff is, is not making a, a difference. And so here's the, a graph of that dependence. This is the photoelectric attenuation. So this is called the mass attenuation coefficients. This is like proportional to how many photons you're going to uh, absorb. And so going in this direction means you're absorbing more photons. This is energy. This is 200 keV right here. And as we go down in energy to, say, 20 keV across this dynamic range, the photoelectric effect gets higher and higher and higher and higher. So that down here in this energy, pretty well photoelectric effect is, is the dominant mechanism, but then when we get out to about here, the uh, Compton scattering is the dominant mechanism. And Compton scattering over our energy range, which is about here, right, is essentially constant as a function of energy. So we've got a spectrum of x-rays. They have uh, essentially the same probability of undergoing Compton scattering across the energy that we're going to use for, for imaging. So that's inside this box. Our Compton scattering is pretty well constant, uh, and the photoelectric effect varies considerably. Okay. This gives us an opportunity, actually, to do multi-energy imaging. So if we take a uh, x-ray picture, suppose we had a mono-energetic x-ray source, we could take a picture here at say, you know, this is uh, 20, 30, 40 keV, 50 keV here, and we get this much, the ratio of photoelectric to Compton would be this, and then we take a 200 keV picture and there's no photoelectric effect, it's just all Compton. So those two pictures would look quite different. Right? So now you've got multi-dimensional data for different tissues. Right? That's called multispectral imaging. We might take a look at that. So the x-ray imaging chain, just to review, we have our x-ray light bulb here. We're going to fil put this filter here. It's usually copper or aluminum, just a little thin, uh, constant piece of copper aluminum to take the low energy photons out of, of the beam so they don't just hit the patient and not get through. <clears throat> so that's that filter. We collimate this beam such that it illuminates an area of the patient that is minimum for what we want to see and through that part of the patient. And then there's some kind of detector on the backside for the shadow. So in quantifying uh, how the intensity of the x-rays 
change as a function of distance through the patient, uh, we'll introduce some pretty simple math here. So, and this is all in uh, prints and links, so I would recommend reading chapter four to, to get the details of this and an alternative explanation. So the intensity is defined as the energy times the photon fluence, where a photon fluence is the number of photons per unit area in a given time. Okay, so that's a fairly simple, uh, sort of sensible definition of what uh, photon fluence is and what intensity is. Intensity goes as energy because usually on the detector, if a high energy thing, a high a higher energy photon hits the detector, you get a brighter, a bigger intensity signal than if it's a lower energy one. So it, it's linear with energy. The fluence, we already know what this looks like because we saw that, that diagram, the histogram. Here, this is the relative amount of x-rays at a specific energy. So if I look at this spectrum here, when I turn my voltage of my x-ray tube to 120, this is the relative number of photons as a function of energy that I get. So that is phi. Right? Uh, when I integrate everything under here, that I get phi. So here's SE is this function here, and DE is you know this axis here. So as I Another interesting thing is as I crank the KVP down, uh, I will get the, the phi value will drop because the integral under this uh, curve goes down. So the total fluence of photons goes down as I'm dropping the voltage, the peak voltage. Right? And so the intensity, we just multiply by the energy, and that uh, gives us the intensity. So I multiply uh, each delta E here by its energy and its relative height, and that gives me the intensity. So how do you, how do you mathematically characterize how the x-rays get attenuated? We saw all the photoelectric effect in Compton are the, the mechanisms, the underlying machinery by which those photons are absorbed. But in just characterizing how many photons are emitted at the back end of the object after you put a beam through it, uh, we use a very simple uh, mathematical description, uh, which is going to be uh, quantified by a thing called the linear attenuation coefficient. And we'll, th this gives you a sort of an a overview of how this works. If I have, say, a thousand photons hitting this object and 20% get absorbed by this thickness of this stuff, let's say this is you know, copper or something like that, 1,000 photons hit it, 20% get absorbed in there, so now I have 800 on this side, right? When 800 hit exactly this, a replicate of this here, what happens is I get 20% of those get absorbed. So you get 640, and again, 20% of those get absorbed, you get 5, 512. When you plot that out, you get a very nice model exponential curve, right, that goes as distance accumulated through here, and the, this coefficient describing this exponential decay is called mu, and it's the linear attenuation coefficient. And that is dependent on what this substance is. Right? So if it's water, you will get a certain fraction of the x-rays will be absorbed. If it's water mixed with a contrast agent that has a lot of iodine, you get a lot more x-ray attenuation, so fewer come out, and this curve will go down much more quickly, right? and the mu value will be higher. Right? So it's the linear attenuation coefficient. A very simple, nice uh, way to, de to describe it. Uh, there's a description in the book. I'm not going to dwell on it right now. You can go and, and derive this in as many ways as you want. It's a simple first-order differential equation, which has a exponential, mono-exponential decay as its solution, right? So we have the number of emerging or the number that hit the target multiplied by the width of the target times the, the um, linear attenuation coefficient. This is a, a 
an uh, interesting number to know for different materials uh, because you know linear attenuation coefficients are given in inverse centimeters and so it's like number of e uh, decays per centimeter and so people don't think in in that uh, unit or that system and so you can calculate ask the question well what value of delta x do I need of this material to get 50% of the photons absorbed? That's called the half value layer. And, um, and so, you know, it's, it's a very simple formula for HVL given if you know mu, but it, it gives you a visceral feeling for like, how much liver do I need to absorb 50% of the photons? Like, do I need three centimeters? Do I need 30 centimeters, right? The, so that, and so uh, some of your problems will look at that and you'll get a, a feeling for how many photons get absorbed for a specific thickness uh, of a material. Okay. So here's some, you know, it's, it's going to be energy dependent again. Uh, and so for muscle and bone, uh, if you're this 100 keV, 50 to 100 is sort of where we're operating in clinical imaging. And you see it's like three centimeters, three to four centimeters, 50% of those photons will be gone. Okay. Bone, it's only one to two centimeters. Uh, this is an interesting aside. I, I, think, I think this is out of the book, yeah, out of uh, prints and links, in that Going back to our local contrast definition, where it's the fractional change in the signal compared to the background, uh, when you do that under the assumption that your uh, signal coming through here is given by this equation, which is the amount of attenuation, so the relative amount of attenuation of x-rays, and you do and you calculate the local contrast as that fraction you get a very simple formula for what that contrast is. And so that's why it makes sense in x-ray imaging, projection x-ray imaging, to define contrast that way, because this comes out as a very simple thing. It's just you know, dependent on the, the thickness. Um, however, when we go to determine, are we able to detect this bump here with respect to the background, I think we're going to measure uh, a and B divided by the RMS of, let's say, we'll, we'll measure the contrast to noise. Okay, if we have uh, a human, and they're about that thick, if we go through the chest this way and out their back that way, so they're about that thick, right? So we saw that a half value layer was three centimeters through a liver, so there's actually a, a fairly substantial amount of attenuation that's going to occur as we're passing through that. That person. But if I, if I have my spot where my x-rays are coming from and I draw a line from that spot to a detector element on my detector, go across, along that line and ask, well, how many photons along that line are going to get absorbed? As I pass through the patient on that ray or that line, I'm passing through multiple different tissue types. Right? I'll, I'll hit skin and fat and perhaps a rib, and then some muscle, and then lung, air, and then, you know, the back of the rib, and then out, right? And so I've gone through some very heterogeneous uh, x-ray attenuation as I move through that tissue. And so to characterize that mathematically, uh, what we do is we say, look, in an inhomogeneous slab, the amount of attenuation that's going to occur is the integral through the object of how mu is changing as a function of, of path through that object. Right? So mu now is a function of position along my ray and my eventual computation of how many x-rays get through look like this where I have the number that hit the front side of the object, and then I'm going along my ray, and I'm going to integrate the linear attenuation coefficient as a function of position along that ray in order to add up how much attenuation is occurring. Right? 
And this, this uh, equation is absolutely essential for understanding how CT works. Because in, in plain film chest x-rays, you get one projection, and, and each ray you get a detected intensity, and that's the brightness of your picture, like that hand you put up. In CT, you would like to know the, actually the linear attenuation coefficient values all along your ray. You want a three-dimensional picture. And so that's what we're going to solve for in CT, is now that we know the number that got through on that ray, we also know that it was the sum across all these linear attenuation coefficients. So if we take enough of those measurements from different angles, we'll be able to invert the whole thing and, and pull out what this function is. Right? So um, it turns out, as we saw in our, you know, our uh, chart here, Attenuation is also proportional to the energy, right? So that basically you get much more attenuation at lower energies than you do at high energies. It takes 1.8 centimeters of muscle to reduce the photons by 50% if they're 30 keV photons versus 150 keV photons. It takes 4.5 centimeters of muscle to reduce it by 50%. So there's an issue here, right? And that is, we know that coming out of our x-ray source, out of our tube, we have a whole spectrum of x-rays. And so, how are we going to cope with that? If you wrote it down explicitly, you would say, my intensity at my detector element is proportional to this integration over space along my ray, right? But I have to evaluate also mu as a function of energy over all of my energies, right? So I should think of it this way. Let's break up my energy spectrum into 100 bins. I'll make 100 pictures, right? And I'll have a value of SE for each one of those bins, right? And add all of that up, and that gives me my final energy, okay? And uh, so this term here, it's kind of a pain in the neck, right? In, in terms of, it's got an extra set of things we have to solve for that we may not have enough data to, to solve for. And so oftentimes what is done is, uh, most of the time, is you just say, well, we'll call the beam an x-ray beam with an average energy. And we'll just put one energy in there. It'll be somewhere in the middle, right? And we'll solve it that way. Uh, so here are some actual values of mass attenuation coefficients, the mu values. Uh, you can look this up. There's the, here's the website here uh, for all of these uh, tissues uh, in, in folks uh, at 20 keV and 100 keV, and these are the values. And you can see why a uh, half-value layer makes more sense to remember, because you know, these numbers aren't that intuitive in terms of what, what it maps out to in, in space. But anyway, all the values are very well measured, very well known. Okay. Uh, and if we look at the linear attenuation coefficient, so this is the mu value, right, as a function of energy for different tissues, the functions look something like this. So at low energies, I get much higher you know, attenuation, so those mu values are at least higher, and then as I go to higher and higher energies, that reduces, right? So it would seem that, you know, if you were to say, well, if I really wanted to, uh, you know, get the best contrast, the biggest fractional change between, uh, let's say, fat, which is this curve, and muscle, and I had a choice of doing it at, at a specific energy, where would I do that? So it, it looks like it gets bigger as you go here, right? So you get much more contrast here. However, if we imaged at this KEV, none of the photons would get out of the back of the patient, right? So you basically have to move this way in order to get a signal coming out of the back of the patient. 
and defining where along here you're going to work. There are many other issues that go into defining what the, the KEV is that you're going to use. In the past uh, decade, the essentially CT used to always be done around here at 120 KEV because x-ray tubes were built that way. That's what they, they put out. But then now that we have a whole new generation of tubes that can give you 80 KEV beams, KEV peak beams at really high MA. So like 1400 MA at 80 KEV. So you still get stuff coming out of the back of the patient because you have enough going in the front side. But they are at a lower energy and so it turns out the dose is much lower to the patient. And uh, what, one of the things we don't do in this course is, is actually a, a detailed computation of dose, which we don't really have time to do it, unfortunately. But. And then contrast agents. This is Hypake, which is a, just a commercial contrast agent. It's not used them. Well, I think it's mostly swallowed. Uh, but it has, it's a sort of organic molecule that has iodine in it, sort of three or four iodine uh, atoms in the molecule. And so iodine is a great x-ray attenuator, and so you get really high values of the linear attenuation coefficient in these contrast agents. And then there's a k-edge, right, at 33 keV, which, which bumps the contrast up. Once you get to a high enough energy that you can eject that k electron from the inner shell, so here I can't eject that electron with a photon of this energy. As I go to higher and higher energy, finally I can knock that, that electron out of the k shell, and so all of a sudden, the attenuation value goes way up because I'm starting to get those interactions as well. So these are called k-edges. And so when you swallow this stuff, this is what it looks like, right? You get really high attenuation through the contrast agent. And this is in a bowel. Uh, you know, after you swallow it and you, and you image the bowel, this is, you know, you know, what it looks like. There's our friend again, ready to swallow that milkshake. Uh, and as we saw last time, uh, that arrow? this is the, the contrast in a, this is um, Omnipake, which is another iodine-based contrast agent uh, to improve the contrast of vessels. We saw that last, last lecture. And it's also done in neuro uh, imaging, and this this actually is in a fluoroscopy system where the patient is lying on a table. You can be doing some kind of intervention and oftentimes say they have an aneurysm in one of the vessels in their brain that you have to go in and, and either clip off or put a coil in or do something like that. Then uh, you can inject a contrast agent and watch it go up into the brain uh, and image with super high resolution on an x-ray fluoroscopy system while you're doing that intervention. And it, that looks like that thing that there's a big red arrow that doesn't happen <laughs> with the system as that was put there by a human uh, but this is obviously some kind of aneurysmal growth there these are really dangerous you don't want to leave that alone because it'll pop one day and bad things happen okay the last thing we got one minute we'll talk about beam hardening and this is also in the book um, so here's the x-ray spectrum relative number of x-rays as a function of energy, right? Uh, we've, we've clicked our, our tube to 100 keV peak, so that's the highest energy we can see. And this, if I look just at the tube, just outside the tube, I would see this spectrum, right? When I put a filter, right, between the tube and the patient, say a copper filter, then I get rid of all of these low energy, like down here, I get rid of this entire set of photons here uh, by being absorbed by that filter. So they're not going to hit the patient. Remember, they wouldn't have done us any good anyway because none of them would have got through. And so this is the spectrum that is post-filter hitting the patient. Right? This is the spectrum leaving the patient. Right? And so Basically, all of these lower energy photons got observed. They're not going to help us make a picture. They're all, they're all in there, but we don't have any contrast from them. Um, 
And this is the spectrum here. And so the mean energy, sort of the average energy of that spectrum, what happened to it? It started down here and it shifted up to here. And this is called beam hardening. And so one of the issues with X-ray imaging, if we're going to take multiple views of an object, is as we go through on one path, the beam itself of X-rays along that line, as I move through that line, the average energy in that beam gets higher and higher and higher as I move along. Right? So the X-rays that are hitting stuff towards the back of the patient are different than the X-rays that entered the front. The ones that entered the front had a lot more lower energy X-rays than the ones that are close to the back. That's called beam hardening. And we will stop there. And then next uh, lecture, we're going to start looking at uh, more mathematical descriptions of linear systems and things like that. OK? So I'll hang around for questions if you have any questions. Yeah.